You may recall that in my last video, I took a look at the Cypress issue and talked a little bit about its background history, the key issues, and why it's proven just so difficult to solve. But as you can imagine, there were any number of questions from viewers about different aspects of the Cypress problem that I wasn't able to tackle. So I thought I'd put together this question and answer video to try and address some of these points that were raised. Hello and welcome from Larnaca in Cyprus. If you're new to the channel, my name is James Kerlinzi and here I take an informed look at international relations, conflict, security and statehood. As always, I had so many great questions and I've only been able to tackle a small fraction of them. So many, many apologies to those who did put forward questions that I haven't answered. I'll try and go through them in the comments and provide answers there. So one of the issues that really came up was about previous settlement efforts and it was a fantastic question from Michael Krustis who asked do you think that the Annan plan in 2004 was a fair and just settlement of the Cyprus problem? Michael thanks so much for this question because this is obviously something that's proven extremely controversial. Uh, so for anyone who might be a little unfamiliar with this uh, the Annan plan refers to the UN settlement proposals that were put forward in early 2004. These were put to a referendum in April 2004 and while two-thirds of Turkish Cypriots accepted the plan three-quarters of Greek Cypriots rejected them. Um, look I know all the controversy that goes around it uh, I know the Annan plan well obviously i had been through it in fact you know I wrote extensively about that process um, Look, I understand why many Greek Cypriots uh, felt deeply unhappy about it but I think the first point I'd make is that for anyone who'd been working on Cyprus for any length of time, uh, you know, we were aware that there was going to be uh, any settlement would be based on a bizonal, bicommunal federation. Uh, so essentially, Cyprus would become two federal areas, one which would be predominantly Greek Cypriot, the other one which would be predominantly Turkish Cypriot. Um, and for anyone who'd looked at this and understood it, I mean, it was fairly clear what a settlement would look like. And as I mentioned in, in, in the other video, um, that it's, it's not, Cyprus isn't particularly complicated. People like to think it is, but in reality, it's not like that. We do know what the outline of a settlement would look like. And to that extent, there was a general sense that the Annan plan conformed to this. Um, Yes, of course, other plans might have uh, different structures uh, in terms of, you know, representation of MPs in Parliament, for example, competences, uh, you know, that the central government would have versus the federal state. But essentially, broadly speaking, I think many people felt the Annan plan uh, was in line with what we'd expect. Um, and this highlighted, I think, what was one of the real problems that we'd seen in Cyprus, is that the political leadership had never really prepared people for what a bizonal, bicommunal federation meant. So it was the mantra, everyone said, we want a bizonal, bicommunal federation. But political leaders had deliberately made sure that people didn't really understand what that meant. And so it meant everything to everyone. It was, you know, it, they all said we want it, but nobody really knew what they you know what it would mean in real terms they thought they knew but when they were confronted with the reality which I think most observers do feel was a bizonal bicommunal federation it came as a real surprise to them this was not what we were expecting uh, was the general view that many people had when in actual fact as I say for those of us who followed Cyprus for a long time uh, you know it was very much in line with that so I think that's the first point to raise that um, you know a lot of opposition to the Annan plan was based on the surprise factor. And I have to accept the fact uh, that the final plan uh, was only put in place a few weeks before the referendum. I mean, we're talking effectively three and a half weeks. There had been earlier iterations of it, but that final, I was about to say agreement, but of course it wasn't really an agreement. It was, you know, the sides had negotiated to an extent, but then it was it was completed by the UN. This was put on the table just three weeks before. So, you know, there wasn't a lot of time to digest this. There wasn't a lot, a lot of time for political leaders to say to people, look, you know, let's go through it. This does conform to the, the you know, what people needed. That said, you also had political leaders who were 
steadfastly opposed to it. So, for example, President Tassos Papadopoulos came out, he said the no vote, um, you know, and I think a lot of people felt very, very let down by that because there was a general sense that, again, this was something that conformed to what people, most outside observers felt that a settlement of the Cyprus problem would look like. There's one other thing that I think is also worth mentioning, and that's the security element, because this was something that was overwhelmingly uh, cited by Greek Cypriots for the reason for their no vote for the Annan plan, that, you know, we, they would say, we didn't like the security elements of it, but, you know, the fact that there would still be a continued Turkish military presence, that there would still be uh, a guarantee uh, clause that would give Turkey, Greece, Britain the right to intervene if the constitutional order broke down. And that was something that I think many, many Greek Cypriots it's found very difficult uh, to accept and you know I, I think there's a you know a general sense of to an extent understandably uh, but of course we have to accept that the Turkish Cypriots also have their legitimate security concerns that needed to be taken care of uh, if another plan was put forward today I suspect it might be a little bit different on those uh, on those elements but I, I would say that if another plan was put forward today I wouldn't necessarily expect it to be drastically different from the Annan plan. Um, so, you know, do I think it was a fair and viable settlement? I think, I think it provided a settlement and I think it provided a, a workable settlement for Cyprus. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've always, always felt that the Annan plan in 2004 was really a missed opportunity for a settlement. And again, I know many Greek Cypriots will, you know, feel very angry about this. They don't like it. You know, they say, you know, it was un unfair. I, I think I, I, I disagree on that. I think it, I think it was essentially uh, could be made to work. So Aaron Ramadan uh, brings up uh, the point that former Greek Cypriot Foreign Minister Nikos Rolandas stated that 15 out of the 17 Cyprus proposals have been rejected by the Greek Cypriot administration. Is it not fair to state that it's the Greek Cypriot side who are the intransigent player at the negotiation table? Look, Aaron, I, you know, when you deal with conflict, the reality is that, you know, both sides will demonise the other. They'll both present each other as being the difficult side. And of course, in Cyprus, it's no different. Uh, and so let's take a step back and consider where we stand today. Now, look, I think the general view of most observers is that yes, 2004 was a lost opportunity. Uh, the Greek Cypriots rejected a UN set of proposals uh, that the uh, Cypriot president, Tassos Papadopoulos, the Greek Cypriot leader, had not negotiated those. Uh, you know, he didn't like it. He made no effort to make them better. Um, so I think there is a sense of, if you like, blame on the Greek Cypriot side for 2004. But I think it's also important to put that in perspective of the long history of the Cyprus issue. And if you were to look, for example, from 1974 to 2004, for that 30 year period, the overwhelming sense was that it was actually, in fact, the Turkish Cypriot side, and in particular, the Turkish Cypriot leader, Ralph Denktaş, who was fundamentally at fault for the failure to get a settlement. And this was something that Denktaş himself openly admitted. Um, now, I, you know, I, there's a story I love to tell of uh, a, a British foreign secretary speaking to Denktaş once and trying to use reverse psychology on him, you know, to say, look, you know, I don't know whether this is a true story, but it does ring true. I met Denktash on a number of occasions and I can imagine him saying this. You know, so the British Foreign Secretary said, look, Miss Denktash, how do you feel about the fact that history is going to judge you as the Turkish Cypriot leader who failed to solve the Cyprus problem? And Denktash apparently, quick as a shot, replied, uh, I think history would be right. Denktash was always very clear in his hardline views and I don't think he ever did really want reunification. And so I think what we have is that uh, you know, and this is something I'm seeing a lot at the moment, that there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk by Turkish Cypriots, well, we've been trying for 50 years to get a settlement and it's the Greek Cypriots who've stood against it. No, I think, you know, what we can say is that certainly in recent years, the main obstacle has seemingly been you know more on the on the Greek Cypriot side. I think you know that much is 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 recognised. But we have to accept that a lot of the reason we are where we are today is because of decisions that were also taken by the Turkish Cypriot side. So simply to say that look, you know the Greek Cypriots have proven to be the long intransigent party is is not true. That most 
people who've dealt with Cyprus, who've looked at Cyprus, would say that actually for the majority of the past 50 years, maybe starting to, you know, we're starting to get into that area now of, you know, 50 50 in time zones but certainly you know many observers would argue that in actual fact many of the best opportunities that we had to solve cyprus especially in the years after 1974 were lost because of the turkish Cypriot leader uh, and because that was also banked up by ankara so i think you know turkish Cypriots and turkey also have to take a degree of responsibility for for the situation of where we are today and of course again you can say that greek Cypriots have also missed opportunities absolutely that's true but as I say to just simply say they are the result that we haven't you know they're the reason why we haven't got a settlement today is just you know I I, I don't recognize that 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 view of events so on another note arms bombs says do you believe Turkish Cypriot rights have been ignored by the international community as the Republic of Cyprus claims to represent all Cypriots but it clearly doesn't um, Look, this is a really, really interesting question, um, you know, because the isolation of the Turkish Cypriots, this is obviously something that Turkish Cypriots feel very, very strongly about. You know, they feel that they've been deprived of the ability to take part, for example, in sporting cultural events, uh, that they've been cut off economically from the world, that they're politically isolated. And of course, look, you know, for many of them, they say, well, this is an injustice. The Greek Cypriots usurped the Republic of Cyprus in 1964. And and, uh, you know, the Turkish Cypriots have been paying the price since. Now, as with all of these things, again, it's a very, very complex picture about what happened. So, for example, in 1963, when the constitutional order broke down, uh, if you speak to the two sides, they will tell radically different stories about what happened. So, um, if you speak to a Turkish Cypriot, they would say, look, uh, we were happy with the Republic of Cyprus, uh, the, you know, it fighting broke out and the Greek Cypriots prevented us from taking part. They threw us out of the government. The Greek Cypriots would say, no, no, no. Uh, the Turkish Cypriots wanted to leave. As soon as fighting broke out, they, they, you know, they all withdrew from the government and you know, they, they pulled themselves into enclaves. Now, of course, the real picture, as often the case, lies between the two. That what we can actually say is that there seems to be evidence that when the fighting did break out, uh, it wasn't uniform across the whole of the island. There were places where there wasn't much fighting going on. And what we saw in those places is that, yes, uh, you know, Turkish Cypriots did try to get into work. Uh, in some cases, they were stopped from doing so by Greek Cypriots. But there is also evidence to suggest that the Turkish Cypriots, also the leadership, ordered their people not to take part in the government, that they wanted to withdraw. Uh, and there was a very interesting case that, you know, uh, senior Turkish Cypriot police officers were put on trial by Turkish Cypriot courts uh, in the months after um, the, the events of 1963 and 64, precisely because they had continued to want to take part in the structures and the institutions of the Republic and, and have them take part. So I think it's important to recognize that, you know, Turkish Cypriots will say to themselves, oh, we were forced out by the Greek Cypriots. But yes, there isn't a degree of evidence to say that that was the case, but there's also evidence to say that they voluntarily withdrew from, from the structures of governance as well, that some of the hardline nationalists saw this as an opportunity to do that. But there were also a number of other things that I think that we have to bear in mind about the isolation of the Turkish Cypriots. And of course, we can't have this discussion about without talking about 1983 and the unilateral declaration of independence. And I have always said this was the biggest mistake that the Turkish Cypriots ever made. You know, the agreement had been in 1977, confirmed in 1979, that there would be a bizonal, bicommunal res um, federation as a resolution of the Cyprus issue, that the sides would come together in a federal model. And in 1983, the Turkish Cypriot leadership, the Turkish Cypriot leader, Ralph Denktash, decided uh, to declare independence. He had been warned time and time again, do not do this. There will be ramifications that you will find that the international community is going to have to act if you do this. And still he went ahead and did it and just days later you had a UN Security Council resolution, Resolution 541, that declared this to be illegal, called on states not to recognise it and what we saw is then subsequent resolutions calling on countries not to engage with the Turkish Cypriots uh, state, self-proclaimed state. 
and you know again this was something that was entirely avoidable that it, it was he warned not to do it if he just maintained the situation of saying look we have our own administration we're working towards a federal uh, a federal settlement of cyprus you wouldn't have had you know the consequence of a UN resolution saying you're not you know to countries you're not to engage with them and that then led to all sorts of lawsuits for example in Europe uh, saying that it was actually you know you couldn't do direct trade with northern Cyprus so I think you know yes there would be a lot of people who would say that uh, the ongoing isolation is unfair especially as the Turkish Cypriots voted overwhelmingly in favor of a settlement in 2004 but again I think you know we have to understand that where we are today is very much a result also of decisions that were taken by the Turkish Cypriot community themselves especially that that really that decision in 1983 and I can't emphasize this enough I've always felt that this was the single biggest mistake that the Turkish Cypriots made I think things would be very very different for the Turkish Cypriots today especially after 2004 if there wasn't that resolution which actually condemned the declaration of independence and told countries not to engage with the Turkish Cypriots. So Ji Wei King asks, will it be possible for Turkey to fully annex northern Cyprus under any circumstances? And if Turkey decides to annex the territory one day, how would this affect relations between Turkey and Greece or even the EU as a whole? This is a really great question because this is obviously something that worries a lot of observers of Cyprus. That in recent years there's been a growing sense that uh, it could very well be the case that Turkey decides that it's going to annex the north and this would have a huge effect if it were to happen. Uh, it would obviously fundamentally change the parameters of any discussion on Cyprus because countries can't just annex territory and then say right okay now we're going to negotiate it away. You know we're seeing this in many ways in the case of Russia and Crimea that you know when a country takes that decision to announce right okay this piece of territory that previously belonged to another country belongs to us now you know that's crossing a huge boundary in international law. I think there's absolutely no doubt uh, that this would bring about the strongest possible reaction from the European Union. I think the United States would be very very firm in its response. I think it would absolutely provoke a crisis uh, in NATO circles. I mean obviously Greece couldn't let this go. Uh, I'm not saying it would take military action but what I think is it would it would absolutely strain relations uh, in in a way that haven't been strained since 1974 so I think that you know it would be a a huge development if this happened which I think a lot of observers feel that you know there's probably a hope that why it isn't likely to happen but even without formal annexation what we're in many ways seeing in any way is what have been has been called soft annexation that what we're actually seeing at the moment any is that uh you know turkey is extending its its control over the north uh that this is something that is proving to be a real worry for many turkish cypriots apart from anyone else uh about this so i think um my sense is that it's possible that we'll see Turkey annex the north. It would, there is absolutely, you know, we can't underplay this. It would be a hugely, hugely significant step if it did. Uh, it would have much, much wider ramifications. It wouldn't just be about Turkey claiming the north. It would fundamentally ter affect Turkey's relationship with the European Union. It would probably uh, have a, a deep, deep effect on Turkey's relationship with the United States. Uh, I think that, you know, it would it would be widely condemned. Uh, so, as I say, I, I think the hope is that Turkey won't go this far, uh, but it is obviously a worry that a lot of observers have. Um, and, you know, if it did happen, as I say, the effects would be enormous. So, Oihan Larenyegi asks, how is the concept of Enesis nowadays? Are Greeks interested in an eventual unification with Cyprus? Do Greek Cypriots care in a political sense about their mainland brothers? This uh, is a fascinating question because uh, the relationship between Greece and Cyprus is obviously extremely complicated. Look, I think the first thing to say is that um, 
many Turkish Cypriots will argue that, you know, underneath all of this, Greece still, you know, wants Cyprus, uh, that the Greek Cypriots still want union with Greece. That's absolutely not the case. If you were to hold a referendum here tomorrow about unification with Greece, the vast, vast majority of Greek Cypriots would reject it. Um, you know, Cyprus is an independent state. It has its own membership of the European Union, its own membership of the United Nations. You know, it, it functions as an independent and sovereign state on the world stage and people are used to that many many ordinary uh, Greek Cypriots uh, you know have a great attachment to the Republic now it wasn't always an easy relationship between the Greek Cypriots and the Republic that's absolutely for certain and that for a long time people wanted Enosis but there is absolutely no doubt today uh, that the vast vast majority of Greek Cypriots uh, would be opposed to Enosis now and this is a big but I think it's important to understand that, you know, questions of identity are obviously extremely complicated. So while most Greek Cypriots would say we don't want to be part of the Greek state, and, you know, for good reason, I mean, Cyprus is independent. If it joined with Greece, you know, it would effectively become an outlying province of the country. Now, it may have a great deal of autonomy. It might have negotiated a position where, you know, it has its own prime minister and autonomous uh, arrangements. but it would still be part of another sovereign state. But all this said, I mean, we also have to understand that the vast majority of Greek Cypriots also see themselves as, in some way or another, Greek now, uh, or more correctly, part of the Greek nation. Now, here it gets really complicated because what will often happen is that and less so these days than, you know, maybe 20, 30 years ago, uh, people will come to Cyprus and they'll see the Cyprus flag flying and the Greek flag flying. And in fact, actually, if you go into the north, it's, you know, it's the same. You'll see the Turkish Cypriot flag flying and the Turkish flag flying. And people will often equate this. Why do they want to be part of Greece? And that flag isn't a symbol of saying we want to be part of the Greek state. It's a part, it's a way of saying we are part of the wider Greek nation. Now, of course, what that means in real terms for ordinary people uh, is extremely complicated. And, you know, look, I, I, I come from Britain and what it means to be British, to be English, Scottish, Welsh, uh, you know, Irish, Northern Irish, uh, is extremely complicated and it means different things to different people. It means different pe things to different people in different contexts. So, you know, for example, if Greece is playing football, many Greek Cypriots will happily cheer on the Greek football team and take great pride in any victories of it. But at the same time, if you sit a Greek Cypriot and the Greek down together, they will, you know, the, you know, the, there'll, there'll be a lot of teasing going on and, 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 and things, and you'll get a sense that in many ways things are very different uh, between Cyprus and Greece, um, that they are very different places. And, you know, look, I've, I've lived in Greece as well, so I've sort of seen it from the other, the other side of how Greeks talk about Cypriots and how Cypriots talk, or Greek Cypriots talk about Greece. Um, and, it's, it, you know, it's a fascinating, fascinating and complex relationship, which isn't as simple as many people like to think on the outside. So I think all this is to simply say is that, look, the, the idea that Enesis is still something that Greek Cypriots hanker after just simply isn't the case. Uh, but Greek Cypriots, obviously, and for very, you know, very clear reasons of language, of religious faith, you know, many Greek Cypriots will go and study in Greece. Uh, you know, from all that experience, there is a natural and close relationship and affinity between Cyprus and Greece, uh, just as there is between the Turkish Cypriots and Turkey. But that doesn't necessarily mean that people want to be incorporated within uh, within the Greek states or within the Turkish states. So, so there were a couple of questions about um, Britain's role in Cyprus and the position of the British bases. So for example, Cricket Man 1 asked, in any sort of peace settlement, do you see British forces withdrawing from Akrotiri and Decalia or would they stay under British control? So the question of the British bases is one that obviously does come up in any talk of a settlement. Now, by way of background, uh, the bases are effectively two main areas in Cyprus, uh, in the east and the west of the islands. Uh, so so essentially you've got Decalia over in, in, in the east and you've got uh, Akrotiri which is uh, a, an airbase over in the west 
and these amount to about 99 square miles of territory uh, that uh, Britain retained when Cyprus became independent and it is considered sovereign territory. This is not lease territory, uh, this is British sovereign territory. And you know, the question of what happens to the bases is something that has come up. Now, in 2003, at the time of the discussions uh, then on the settlement, uh, Britain put forward an offer to effectively um, give up half that territory in the event of a settlement. Um, now, it hasn't been formally restated since then, uh, but the general view is that in the event uh, that the sides were able to reach an agreement and a settlement, uh, that the offer that was made in 2003 still stands, uh, that Britain would, would certainly give up half, half, of, um, half of the bases if, if that were to happen. So Dynamite asks, are the two sides better off apart than reunited? Is that on the table for a possible resolution of the dispute? Why or why not? Dynamite, look, this is a really, really great question because, um, you know, this is obviously, I think, something that any of us who look at Cyprus often ask ourselves that, you know, m is it better for the two sides to, to, to be apart, uh, that, you know, just simply get on as neighbours? Look, I have always believed in reunification. I believe in it very strongly. I think that it actually does serve uh, the people of Cyprus. Um, you know, it, it, it's the best outcome for them. Now, you know, what that settlement would look like, I can perhaps return to in a minute. But what I would say is that, yes, I do think that the current division of the island is unhealthy. Uh, you know, for anyone who's been here, you sort of see it, it it's tense, it's, this is not settled. This is, there are all sorts of outstanding issues that need to be dealt with. And I think that, you know, it is possible to reach a settlement, and I think a settlement is still desirable. You know, this is a militarised boundary that exists between the two sides. You know, there's a 60 UN, a year UN peacekeeping presence here, um, you know, which, as I say, is very jarring for anyone who comes here because the island doesn't feel like, you know, it's teetering on the brink of conflict, but there have been moments where there have been real tensions. And I can remember in the middle of the 1990s that there was a period when, you know, really it could have descended back into violence. And I was living here on the island at the time and I remember it, you know, very, it was a very, very nervous moment that, you know, there was a possibility of, of you know, actual full fighting erupting again. So, you know, we can't necessarily be complacent, uh, you know, that everything is peace and calm and maybe we should just sort of keep it like this. And again, it, it's not settled. There's an outstanding problem, and you know, Security Council resolutions which determine that, you know, there's got to be uh, an agreement between the sides that we know what, you know, the, the outline of that agreement is. So I think my sense is that, look, I think it's very tempting to think um, that, you know, what, we have a status quo, we can live with that status quo, why not just do it? Uh, I, I, I don't think it is working, frankly. Um, it, it's certainly not working for the Turkish Cypriots who, who are very isolated as a result of it. Um, but I think that having that militarised boundary just isn't, isn't, isn't good for anyone. And that, you know, if you can reach some sort of negotiated settlement, and I think that settlement would probably be best as, as reunified under a federal model, uh, then I, I think that, you know, I, I'm firmly convinced that, that that really still remains the direction to go. On a related note, Luxembourgish Empire asks, if you were to suggest a plan for Cypriot unification, what would it look like and how do you think it would solve the dispute? Thanks so much for that question. Um, do you know, I do believe that a federal agreement is still the most logical and sensible approach uh, to, to trying to reunify the island. Um, you know, and again, I do passionately believe that reunification is desirable and possible, uh, although, you know, obviously feeling very, very pessimistic about the prospects for that actually happening at the moment. But in terms of the sort of model that um, I envisage, look, you know, I don't hide that I long have long believed that some sort of loose uh, decentralised federation is the, the way forward. Um, that I think the two sides are absolutely better together uh, in, in some sort of unified state. 
but I think that you know we have to accept that the Greek and Turkish Cypriots have got very used to living separate lives and you know if we are to make a settlement work you know one thing that you realize is that you need to minimize the points of friction between the two communities so why to have it that they're going to be arguing over things that they don't need to be arguing about why you know why do you need to have a tight you know a tight arrangement where you return for ex to, you know to, to 1960 or even go further than that I mean you know things like education absolutely can be devolved to the two communities there's all sorts of issues that can and focus on what are the main competences that a Cypriot state functioning internationally as a member of the European Union would need to fulfill and beyond that try and push for a situation where you know everything else is effectively controlled by the Turkish and Greek Cypriots within their own sort of communal um, area now you know we can get into questions about you know identity and maybe I'll talk about that in a minute but you know what I think is important to stress is that I do think that the federal model still represents the best opportunity for Cyprus and that a, a loose decentralized federation is the best way forward now I mean many Greek Cypriots oppose this because they hear the word weak federation or loose federation and they think that it actually refers um, to the strength of the federation as uh, an international actor as its legal personality that if you talk about a loose federation that what you're effectively saying is a weak country that will break apart again that's absolutely not what this means uh, and that there can be all sorts of guarantees safeguards put in place that mean that if things go wrong again the Turkish Cypriots can't just walk away from the agreement and this is something that many Greek Cypriots worry about they think that you know if it goes wrong if they've reunified the Turkish Cypriots will declare independence again and they'll get international recognition you can take all sorts of steps to stop that from happening you know you can put in Security Council resolutions which reconfirm the state of affairs that's created uh, that prohibits secession you know that countries aren't going to recognize if the Turkish Cypriots do this they haven't been recognized up to now if they go in and it looks obvious that all they've done is created the situation to them destabilize the new state of affairs and walk away that's not going to be taken well by the international community and they're not going to reward the Turkish Cypriots for doing that so that argument that somehow a loose federation means a weak federation I think we need to push back against that argument uh, you know and, and, and correct that impression no a loose federation really or decent federation instead refers to the fact that by and large and in as many areas as possible Greek and Turkish Cypriots will just be allowed to get on and do their own thing so there were a couple of questions about uh, energy and natural gas Shanghai discovery says does the discovery of gas deposits complicate any resolution of this conflict or could it actually in part help to resolve the problem by providing funding for compensation for lost property and investment into nation building so likewise Stavros Lazarou asks what role could hydrocarbons discovered in the East Med play in helping to solve the Cyprus problem um, so by way of background uh, this refers to the fact that you know there's been a lot of exploration uh, for natural gas lying off the coast of Cyprus and for many observers this has presented uh, potential of you know an opportunity to act as a catalyst for a, a, a resolution of the Cyprus problem now look I'm going to be very honest on this I've always been very very skeptical about this I have always felt that it actually creates a complication rather than an opportunity for settlement um, that I think that it's now just become an added source of tension between the sides about you know how they're going to explore you know how they're going to share the revenues um, so one can actually see the argument that I think it's actually set things back and made uh, a settlement more difficult I can see the argument for why it should have made a settlement easier because it then becomes the incentive for the Greek Cypriots you know to, to reach a settlement in order to be able to uh, settle the issue with the Turkish Cypriots and leave the way open for exploration uh, for the Turkish Cypriots it's beneficial because they'll get access to these revenues it'll help to develop them you know in the event of a settlement but instead what we've seen is that it's just become a point of contention of you know how those revenues going to be shared the Turkish Cypriots arguing that uh, you know they have an equal uh, right to them uh, you know as co-owners of the Republic which 
you know, if one's to be very honest, you, you know, they've declared independence and now they're saying, well, you know, we're an independent state, we're an independent sovereign state, oh, now energy has been found, we have a claim to it. I think, you know, there is a, a certain, you know, make up your mind, you know, you either are or you aren't. Um, and so I think, you know, it's, 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 it's a tricky issue and I, I tend to feel that it's, it's, it's more complicating as a factor rather than as a catalyst for solution. But I think it's also important to emphasise that in many ways this might actually be becoming a bit of a, uh, you know, a moot issue. That, you know, there seems to be a, a sense that the boat has been missed on this. That, you know, this was being first talked about a decade ago. They haven't made progress on exploiting any of this. And the world is starting to change. Now, I know everyone would say, you know, energy prices at the moment because of Ukraine. But I think the longer trajectory is obviously towards renewables moving away. I mean, natural gas is a bit of a, a strange because it's talked of as a transition fuel and, and, and things like that. But essentially, you know, this is yesterday's, you know, this is fossil fuels of yesterday and we're trying to look beyond that. So I think by the time, you know, they might be in a position to really be exploiting this, it's, it's not going to matter anyway. So ZD Vickery asks, does the TRNC or any factions within have a vision for what it wants to achieve? Full independence, annexation by Turkey, are they working to make anything in particular happen? I get the sense that the status quo is pretty good for the Greek Cypriots, but I wouldn't expect the Turkish Cypriots to feel the same way. You're absolutely right. And this is such an interesting point because, you know, again, when we talk about identity, you know, this means any number of things to different people. So whoever you speak to from the Turkish Cypriot community, they're going to give you a very, very different sense of what they want, how they see the future, how they see the themselves, uh, you know, what sort of reunification they want, would they want union with Turkey. Now I think, you know, the thing to say is that, you know, Turkish Cypriot society is very polarised on this. You'll have some Turkish Cypriots who feel themselves to be very, very clearly Turkish and see the possibility for uh, some sort of annexation by Turkey or unification with Turkey. Many other Turkish Cypriots uh, will obviously say Turkey is our protector uh, and for that we're grateful but we are different and we don't want to be a part of Turkey um, and you know I think what we've been seeing especially over the past decade is that Turkey's influence in the north has been growing uh, and that this has been a real source of concern uh, for for many for many many people not just Turkish Cypriots but outside of, of observers as well because this does mean that what we you know that that greater influence that's been exerted as for you know another vision for for cyprus i mean the reality is that you know the turkish cypriot has declared independence in 1983 this hasn't been recognized uh by any country other countries as yet i'll talk a little bit more about that in another question though um and i think that many people really understand that this isn't going to happen uh, that you know you're not going to get to a situation where the TRNC is a member of the United Nations. Uh, we might get to a situation where a number of countries recognise it. Uh, there's always been the sense that you know the best hope for uh, recognition comes from Muslim states. Uh, they've been very cautious about doing it up till now. They've given the Turkish Cypriots a degree of uh, interaction that, you know, for example, the Organization of uh, Islamic Conference in the past has uh, called for the opening up of uh, economic and cultural ties with the Turkish Cypriots, but has stopped short of admitting uh, Northern Cyprus, the TRNC, as a, a member of the organization. And I think that a lot of these countries are very nervous about separatism, about independent secessionist movements within their own country, uh, and so haven't recognized uh, Northern than Cyprus as an independent state, and I don't think that a lot of them are going to. Um, so I think many Turkish Cypriots understand that independence just isn't something uh, that realistically is going to be, you know, full internationally accepted independence is something that's going to be on the agenda. Uh, so I think that's a really, really uh, important point to bear in mind. And so, you know, 
if annexation with Turkey isn't something that's desirable, if independence isn't something that's feasible, uh, then I would say that reunification in many ways is something that would ultimately be logical. Um, that, you know, again, I think that this offers the best hope for the Turkish Cypriots to be partners with the Greek Cypriots in a, you know, a reunited Cyprus, a reformulated Cypriot state, uh, I think I think offers them the best hope, um, you know, rather than being a, a small outlying province of Turkey or trying to continue to live in isolation, uh, pursuing an idea of independence, which just is going to be recognized and as I say I think I think we can see a settlement where that would be possible so I think you know um, for a lot of Turkish Cypriots that remains the best option and as I said you know in in the main video that I did um, that you know I think the feeling is and we you know, bear in mind, we can't take it for granted, but I think the feeling is that if another referendum was put on the table for reunification, the Turkish Cypriots would still vote in favour. Now, you know, again, some people may disagree with that and sort of say, you know, that isn't necessarily the case, but my sense is that, you know, if something was, you know, if, if there was a process and it was put on the table, and assuming that Turkey would support that, then I think we would see the Turkish Cypriots vote for reunification. So. Barclay Zero asks, what happens if the Greek Cypriots are not keen on reunification? The status quo is surely not sustainable. The North is an isolated, ignored entity. At what point would there be pressure legally and or politically and or morally for the Greek Cypriots to recognise the North as a separate state? This is such an interesting question because, you know, I think that if I'm to be really honest, I think that patience is starting to run out. Uh, you know, that for many years, um, you know, I've been very open and most observers have felt that uh, it has been the Turkish Cypriot side that prevented the settlement. That all changed in 2004. We saw the UN put forward a plan. Now again, you know, Greek Cypriots would argue whether it was fair or just or whatever, but the international community supported that plan and felt that but the international community supported that. But the international community supported that plan and felt that it was a viable settlement. And you know, there has been a sense that the Turkish Cypriots have been uh, isolated. That it, you know, that there is, there should have been steps taken uh, to to recognise their steps in trying to get, reach a settlement in in 2004, and that hasn't happened. And I think there is a sense that of frustration developing, that we're still not getting close to a settlement. Uh, I think that the recent talk we've had from the Turkish Cypriots and from Turkey about a two-state solution has been extremely unhelpful. But I think there is also a sense amongst many observers that, you know, Greek Cypriots themselves, you know, they talk a lot about settlements, but the reality is that they've become very comfortable with the situation. And look, you know, one can argue that there may be good reasons for that, that you know, there's a nervousness, as I talked about in the main video, about what reunification would mean. And I think those are legitimate concerns, but you know, there is still a sense amongst many observers that in actual fact, the Greek Cypriots are just hanging on to this situation. They don't really want to reunify with the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, you know, they have their concerns about it, but it might be more than that. Uh, but at the same time, they're not willing to let the Turkish Cypriots just go their own way. And so what we do here is that there are voices that come out and say, well, look, you know, maybe we need to start thinking uh, about uh, recognising Northern Cyprus. Uh, again, I think that most countries are very, very nervous about doing this and for good reason, uh, that they don't want to set a precedent um, for secessionism. Uh, and especially as well, remembering that 1974, this was something that was brought about by, you know, by military action. There will be a lot of people who would sort of say, well, look, you know, why is it that, you know, a, a division of Cyprus that was brought about by Turkish military intervention, whatever the reasons for that. And remembering, of course, that even if Turkey was justified for, for 1974, the original invasion, uh, a point controversially I, I see the argument for, 
it was to return the situation to the status quo ante, you know, to, to the situation that should have was created in 1960, and that obviously hasn't happened. So I think a lot of people sort of say, well, you know, if you use military force to change the status, you know, the status on the ground, then that shouldn't then be recognised uh, later on. And that, you know, are you then simply encouraging countries to invade other territories and hope that with the passage of time that that will be legitimised? So you start to get into quite serious political and moral questions in, in, in that regard. But on the other hand, there is a moral question that people are asking. Well, you know, the Turkish Cypriots have isolated. They've shown their willingness to, to reach a settlement in 2004. Uh, we've seen it from other leaders in recent years as well. The current leadership in, in Northern Cyprus certainly hasn't uh, made life easier. It's talking about two-state solutions and is considered to be very hard line. And, and that actually, you know, I've, I've always felt sets back the Turkish Cypriot cause, that in actual fact, you know, the Turkish Cypriots maybe the international community hasn't or it certainly hasn't kept up its side of the bargain in terms of easing the isolation after 2004 but things have certainly been a lot easier when you've had a leadership in the north which has been uh, more openly in favor of unification and at the moment we don't have that leadership uh, i think you know we have a very hardline leadership uh, and that's very very problematic for the turkish cypriots so in actual fact i'd say that you know uh, the situation we have at the moment is making it more difficult for the Turkish Cypriots to get that, um, you know, that that openness that they might be after. But all this is to say that I think, yes, I think we will continue to see more talk of opening up uh, to the Turkish Cypriots. But I don't expect that we're going to see sort of major pressure in the years ahead certainly in the, in the short to, to medium term um, for the Greek Cypriots to recognise Northern Cyprus. I don't think things are changing you know, to that extent at the moment, but I think there are certainly going to be debates about opening up uh, to the Turkish Cypriots. And so Elias Solomu asks, the UN ordered all member states not to recognise the TRNC as a state in 1983. What actions, if any, could the UN undertake against any state that recognises the TRNC? Likewise, Wizard asks, do you think in future we could see any UN member states, whether Turkish allies or otherwise, recognise Northern Cyprus, whether by themselves or through being incentivised? Really, really good question, because obviously this is something that uh, we haven't seen any other country recognise the TRNC. Well, Bangladesh recognised it, but only for a couple of days uh, in 1983 before it was persuaded not to recognise. Um, but it is something that is being talked about. I don't think we're going to see a situation of mass recognition of the TRNC anytime soon. Uh, but I think there are signs that one or two countries are starting to change their positions uh, and moving more in that direction. So, for example, there was a, a very interesting incident last year uh, where the you know Pakistan announced that it was sending a consular visit uh, to the TRNC rather than Northern Cyprus, and uh, you know it seems that even though that this was highlighted. So maybe it was an error that it put out a Twitter message. Uh, the foreign ministry hadn't realised this was happening. Uh, and, you know, people raised it and said, you know, sh this should be corrected. It wasn't changed, uh, which rather sends a signal. So that doesn't necessarily mean recognition, but it is quite clearly a message that was coming from the Pakistan government about where it stood in, you know, in relation to the Turkish Cypriots, that it was opening up to them. More recently, we saw a situation where um, the uh, Azerbaijani president uh, met with the Turkish Cypriot leader, but it was advertised as a meeting between the president of Azerbaijan and the president of the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And this was put up on uh, the Azerbaijan government website. Um, so in actual fact, that sails extremely close to the wind in terms of recognition and you know i think because it's such a complex situation and very very politically sensitive uh you know there might still be grounds for arguing that this doesn't amount to recognition but it's very very close to it if it isn't uh you know so i i think you know we could very well be in a situation where azerbaijan has recognized the TRNC and of course it's extreme you know it owes Turkey some favors uh, for you know Turkish help in sort of you know Azerbaijan steps to win back Nagorno-Karabakh 
uh, Azerbaijan always stopped short of recognizing the TRNC precisely because of the question of Nagorno-Karabakh, that it would be accused of hypocrisy, you know, that it recognizes the annex or the, the independence of a breakaway territory of another country while fighting against the breakaway of a part of its own territory. So it was always in a very sensitive position, but one gets the sense that, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely moving in that direction. And once one or two have done it, then, you know, obviously the way is going to be open uh, for others to do so as well. And so I think that this is something that is going to be worrying the Cypriot government at the moment. Um, I don't think, as I say, that we'll see a mass movement towards recognition, but, you know, obviously one or two uh, is a very, very powerful symbol, especially as we're coming up now for 40 years since Turkey, you know, uh, since Northern Cyprus declared independence as the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So I think, you know, um, this could be something that the UN is going to have to deal with. But, you know, if countries are very careful about doing it without necessarily coming out and saying, here's a statement, we recognize Northern Cyprus, um, you know, recognition is essentially a sovereign decision. So countries can choose to recognize if they want or if they don't want. Uh, and, you know, there's nothing the UN can officially do to stop that. So, you know, you can potentially slap sanctions on countries, but you can't actually annul it. You can't say to a country, you have no right to recognize it. This has, uh, you know, no legal validity. You can say a declaration of independence is not legal, but you can't actually tell a country that its decision to recognize another country is, is, is null and void. Uh, so there isn't a lot in that sense that the UN could do. The UN can't pass a resolution saying we take note that country X has recognized, uh, you know, the so-called Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. This has no, uh, you know, this is not valid and does not stand because, as I say, recognition is a sovereign act. It stands because that country has recognized it. Turkey has recognized Northern Cyprus and, you know, the there's not much that you can really do to stop it. So, uh, you know, you can take political measures. Uh, the European Union could take economic measures. You know, it could well be the case that if a country did recognize Northern Cyprus, the European Union would say, well, look, you know, this is just going too far. This is unacceptable. Uh, Northern Cyprus is considered to be part of the Republic of Cyprus and is therefore a part of the European Union. And you have just, uh, you know, recognize independence from part of a member state uh, and so put sanctions in, on on the country that does that but that in turn presents all sorts of problems in its own right so you know i think we get into a very very complex situation if countries do recognize and again you know what we're starting to see is almost slow recognition by stealth which you know for those of us who work on recognition tell you that's not really how it works you either recognize or you don't recognize but what we are seeing is countries gradually pushing the boundaries to the point that you know if they do formally recognize well they're pretty much there already uh, but they haven't they haven't formally said you know we recognize uh, so I think as I say there's not a lot that can be done the Greek Cypriots have fought a very strong campaign the Republic of Cyprus has fought a very strong campaign to stop recognizing over the years and it has been remarkably successful but again it's been so long now that I think there are countries that are starting to ask themselves especially as I say Muslim countries um, that have shown a certain degree of affinity for the Turkish Cypriots uh, have started to ask themselves well maybe you know we need to be opening up to them and potentially in the next few years recognize uh, northern cyprus so that's going to be something that i think is is going to be a concern for for the republic uh in, you know in the years ahead so nt asks do you believe that the majority of greek cypriots would be comfortable if they had a turkish cypriot neighbor conversely do you think the majority of turkish cypriots would be comfortable with a greek cypriot neighbor look this really is at the heart of the cyprus problem and the talk of reunification you know can we see the two cypriot communities living side by side not just you know maybe as neighbors in 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 neighborhoods but you know neighbors on the island sharing islands and i like to think that you know we can see that i think things have moved on in cyprus since 1960 when when the problem really first arose because you know the process of independence was very difficult uh, the communities did become divided uh, for all sorts of reasons I think you know because of the different aspirations the Greek Cypriots wanted union with Greece the Turkish Cypriots wanted partition uh, you know, there's been talk about Britain's revolt, uh, you know, um, involvement in, in, in that process. Um, 
But I think Cyprus today is a very different place from 1960. Cyprus in 1960 was impoverished. Uh, people didn't have a lot to lose. I think, you know, if you look at Cyprus today, it's much wealthier, it's much more successful. I don't think ordinary Greek and Turkish Cypriots are going to want to put that at risk uh, because they're upset that, you know, their neighbour, you know, is now Mehmet or Kostas. I just really don't see that um, as being quite a, you know, the, the problem it was before. You know, you're going to look around, you're going to say, look, you know, I've got a nice life, I've got a good car, you know, my kids go to a good school, I can afford, you know, to go away, you know, maybe once a year and have a nice holiday abroad. Why to put all that at risk? And I think that there is a strong argument to say that in international relations, this is why economic prosperity often runs hand in hand, you know, with less chances of conflict, because I think people then start to question, why would I put all that at risk? because I don't like my neighbour coming from a different, you know, and people tend to sort of then learn live and let live. Of course, the danger is always that you can have hotheads, that people who want to upset things, that you have nationalists who, you know, just unwilling to accept the situation and can stir things up. But by and large, I think that I think there is much more of a live and let live attitude. And in any case, even if we were talking about reunification, the reality is that you know, the chances of the number of Greek Cypriots going and living in, in the north, in the area that would probably remain under Turkish Cypriot control, and vice versa, Turkish Cypriots coming and living, uh, you know, in, in areas that would be under Greek Cypriot control, are probably fairly small. Um, so I don't think we would suddenly see a situation where there was a large influx of Turkish Cypriots into Greek Cypriot neighbourhoods, or Greek Cypriots into Turkish Cypriot neighbourhoods. Uh, so I don't think, you know, this is going to be quite a problem. So yes, I think they can live side by side and I think you know they can have a very positive cooperative relationship that doesn't you know isn't isn't going to descend into violence but of course you know this is something that a lot of people on the island do worry about and I think also adds to that overall sense of nervousness about a settlement uh, as a whole. So um, I Again, I had so many questions and I'd love to be able to answer more of them, but I think I'm going to probably have to leave it there. I hope it was useful uh, and interesting. Uh, you know, obviously Cyprus is a place that, you know, means a lot to me and, you know, I've spent a lot of time here. Uh, if there's one message, you know, that to take away, I, it is that I do believe that reunification uh, is, is certainly uh, beneficial. Uh, sadly, I think it's becoming increasingly difficult to see how that's going to happen. Uh, but I do think that it offers a lot of advantages to both communities. But, you know, it, it's not going to be easy. I think, you know, we obviously have to take into account the, the legitimate concerns that both communities have about a settlement, what it'll mean for their future. Uh, but it is certainly something worth striving for. And, you know, so, you know, of course, I will, all my very best wishes to the people of Cyprus. You know, it's a country that I know well. I've lived here for, for, for many, many years in the past uh, and still retain very close ties to the island. Uh, and what I would say is that for anyone who hasn't been here, who doesn't know the island, if you get an opportunity, it's absolutely well worth a visit. Uh, it's a fascinating place. Uh, yes, of course, you have the political situation, uh, but you have so much history, so many interesting things. Um, I just have to comment that this church uh, behind me is I think one of my favourite locations in Cyprus for, for the reason that this is actually the Church of St Lazarus and uh, for any of you who you know knows their Bible and their New Testament uh, Lazarus was the person that Jesus brought back from the dead and uh, the story has it that uh, after that he actually came here to Cyprus and became a bishop here in Larnaca and this is where he's buried uh, he did die again um, and so this is actually a really really interesting site so if any of you ever wondered what happened to the person Jesus brought back from the dead uh, he's buried here in Larnaca and uh, it's it's a lovely lovely building uh, one of 
so many absolutely beautiful sites. I mean, the island is filled with all these places, and now I am sounding. Somebody commented in 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 to my previous video that I made it sound like I was uh, presenting Cyprus, you know, a tourist brochure of Cyprus. Yeah, maybe a little bit, but um, you know, absolutely, absolutely well worth a visit if you can make it here. So anyway, I hope all this has been interesting, useful, helped to make a little bit more sense of, of, of Cyprus and the issue. And again, any comments that and questions that I wasn't able to answer, I'll do my very, very best to to come back to them in 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 written comments. Thanks, and as ever, see you in the next video.